Tim, the reason you didn't get the question about Ansible Tower being open sourced is because uh, someone asked it during the panel discussion or you know before lunch. So we, we answered it hopefully correctly there. Then we said that it was going to take time, but consistent with Red Hat's uh, you know, mission, we do move everything into the community over time. So good. All right. So I think we got this going now. Um, thank you to the back, the, the tech team for getting this all set up for us. So we're going to, you know, change gears a little bit now from, um, from this morning. You know, this morning we were setting a very high stage around um, digital transformation, digital business, and how, you know, this spills into the imperatives of the IT organization to transform the company, respond to changing conditions. But we're also going to, we, you heard Steph Bacon talk about how um, the portfolio that we're delivering also enables all this. Well, we're going to now dive a little bit deeper, but also recognize that to get started on any of these digital transformation initiatives, you have to first modernize. And you know you have to deal with your existing infrastructure. And we're going to talk a bit more about the infrastructure side of things right now. We'll touch on some app, uh, app deployment as well, but mostly infrastructure. But you have to start somewhere. You have to start with that infrastructure, and you have to modernize it. And this is a key imperative. So. Aside from all the digital transformation, when you really look at a lot of the, the research, IT modernization is, is one where uh, CIOs are talking about being a, this being a key initiative of them, to modernize the infrastructure that they have, ultimately preparing for digital business. So let's start with a little bit of a quiz. So what is IT modernization? Is it a marketing buzzword and a Gartner framework? Is it a term that's been around since the 80s? Is it a government program under President Clinton from you know, the late 80s? Um, is it how IT vendors are convincing customers that they need to buy something? Or is it many things to many people? Well, I think it's, it's all of the above, except it's not a government program. Uh, but it really is many different things. And, and the theme of today's, this presentation that I'm going to walk you through is to, to explain that it does there are many components, many paths you can take on the road to modernization. And that's going to be the recurring theme. Uh, because it is really many things to many people, and you can start it a lot of different ways. So let's start by looking at what modernize is, definitionally. You know, I just took this right out of um, you know, the, a web-based dictionary. But there are some things that really jumped out at me, and those are the things I emboldened. You know, the, the notion of adapting. Um, modern equipment, modern ideas or methods, um, you know, the, the mention of modernizing manufacturing facilities. We've heard a lot of comparison of manufacturing facilities to a data center. Um, you know, DevOps, you could argue that DevOps is, is a lot of uh, kind of lean principles and, and, you know, Agile Agile is a lot of lean principles. Kaizen and, you know, Kanban and all these principles that manufacturing systems worked on in the 80s with Toyota and Deming and, and making their way into the U.S. Are, you know, really now being embraced by, by IT. Um, and then the last bu bullet I really liked a lot because we must modernize to survive um, in terms of getting up to date, getting with the, the times, innovating. And that to me is really the bridge to the digital business. You know, to survive and become a digital business, you've got to modernize to survive. And that's really the imperative, but it all comes back to the underlying uh, technology and capabilities that IT has. And so, as I said, because it means so many things to so many different people, it can mean all of these things. Um, and it has meant all of these things over the last 20 years. It has meant moving from mainframes to distributed systems. It has meant, you know, risk Unix migration to x86 and Linux. It has meant storage area networks um, and you know, cap coupling the networking topology with your storage. It has meant SOA, service-oriented architecture and web services, ESBs. You heard Steph talk about all of these technologies. And it also can mean virtualization. So ultimately, it does mean many things, like these various bullets I'm highlighting here. And over time, it's, it's been in existence. As I said, it's been around for decades, because a lot of these initiatives began 20 years ago and are still around today. But as Gartner talks about modernization is a priority, and I mentioned this a, a minute ago, modernization is a priority 
for the, the enterprise. They're looking at modernizing core business applications. They're moder looking at modernizing infrastructure. They're looking at extending the capabilities uh, as a top priority of their IT initiatives. So this is really something that Gartner talked about um, in a report about a year ago. A different report, um, this is actually a survey that Red Hat conducted with you know, many customers, some of the, the, the respondents may be you in this room. We surveyed about 765 Red Hat participants or customers and asked them, what major initiatives are you implementing within your IT environment? And you can look through the list, I'll just pluck a few here, but increasing automation, virtualization, infrastructure consolidation, um, security and compliance, data application, data and application integration. So these are all responses that came back um, from, from the, you know, the respondents to the survey. And it really is the opportunity for IT to, to do this. And as I said as well a minute ago, to become a digital business, you know, you, you've got to head for the cloud, but the long road of modernization is required to get there because you need to have modern systems to respond and, and to deliver the capabilities of the digital business. And I will talk about some specific examples as we get into the presentation. And you know, it's a journey though. It's a journey with many on-ramps and off-ramps, um, many roads to travel, and that's again, this is kind of the recurring theme that we're gonna use throughout. But ultimately this modern, uh, this, this many on-ramps to the digital business and digital transformation requires the modern infrastructure on which you ride. So let's start by talking about what it means to be a digital business. And, and a lot of these are the things that Steph and I talked about this morning. You know, being a digital business can be defined by a set of attributes. It can be defined by uh, how, are you, it, how are you in terms of stream, being streamlined and automated. So digital businesses think of themselves as very efficient, very streamlined and automated. They think of themselves as being scalable, inelastic, scaling up and scaling down. They think of themselves as being agile, very responsive to changing market conditions, new customer requirements, new competitive threats. And then finally, they think of, digital businesses think of themselves as de delivering a utility, a utility-like service that can be uh, recognized you know, by plugging into, a, almost like plugging into the wall to get electricity or turning on uh, the faucet to get tap water. So those are the attributes of a digital business. But we think of them, and we recognize that, these are delivered by core underlying you know, capabilities that IT delivers through technology. So in other words, to become streamlined and automated, there are many things you can do within IT to help you know, be a streamlined and automated and efficient digital business. You can think about configuration management, self-service, provisioning, um, you can think about workflow and automation and um, business rules. And we're gonna talk about some of the specific offerings that Red Hat has that f fit this, but I think you can already hear me leading you to, to think about things like Ansible, with Tim, which Tim just talked about. Things like our business rules management platform that's I think being presented in the next room. How do we, you know, how does the digital business become elastic and scalable? Well, they, they think about things like cloud, cloud-like capabilities, whether that's a public cloud or a private cloud, even things like hybrid cloud and cloud bursting. So these are the ways in which a digital business can achieve the scalability or elasticity. What about the agility? Um, so the way we think about agility is also through rapid application development and deployment. And you know, how applications can be developed, provisioned in matters of, you know, hours or days, instead of these month or quarter long cycles that it takes to develop, test, and stand up in production and new application functionality. And then, finally, the utility-like services that digital businesses think of themselves as delivering do depend on highly managed, policy-driven, um, you know, highly available um, services and capabilities that are, again, running on top of infrastructure that, that fulfills this. And as I've also touched on, again, the many paths to choose. 
there are many paths to choose. And where do you begin? And we'll, we'll talk about that. The many paths involve, you know, do I start with my platforms, with my network, with my storage, with my applications, how I manage, virtualization, security. So there's no right answer here. You can start on one or multiple of these paths. Um, and most companies do that. Most start on with multiple of these paths. But there's no right answer. There's no right sequence or right place to begin. But there are important questions to ask before you get started. So you ask yourself, you know, OK, what am I trying to achieve? Before I start investing in um, virtualization or storage area, you know, software-defined storage, you know, what are my business objectives? What am I really trying to achieve? Only you can answer that in conjunction with your, your business, in, you know, line of business teams. Where are you starting from? Are you, know, are you starting from a point where you have, um, you know, mainframes, solely mainframes? Or are you starting from a point where you may have already moved into Linux and, and you've got some, many of your application sets running on Linux systems? You have to ask, ask where you're starting from and what's the current state. What are the obstacles that you're going to find as you embark on this journey? What are the bumps in the road? Are they cultural impediments? Are they, um, are they technologically, uh, technological impediments, you know, technical debt? We talk about technical debt a lot. You know, what are really those obstacles? And, and finally, what do you need to succeed? What do you need in terms of the skill base, in terms of the technologies and tools, the processes, and just your overall company culture? Um, a customer that spoke at Red Hat Summit in June, and some of you were probably there, he talked about the cultural changes to drive change within IT and how that was far more um, important than anything that he embarked on. He, he wasn't the CIO, but he reported to the CIO, and he talked about the fact that to modernize this, the infrastructure of this particular retailer, the cultural change and the mindset change within their company was the, the most significant initiative that he undertook to get things moving. Another way to look at this is, you know, the, I talked about this this morning, is balancing this notion of bimodal priorities. Um, because you want to strive to the, for these new age cloud capabilities, but you also have to contend with the fact that you have existing things that run your business. Existing applications that are mission critical, networks, uh, storage and data, et cetera. And so this was another cut of the same data that I mentioned earlier, um, which was, was collected about a year ago. And modernizing existing IT was cited pretty, pretty strongly, you know, in the middle of the path, but still pretty strongly as the biggest IT challenges in 2016. But when you look closely, and I know this chart is not maybe as visible as it should be, but when you look closely, you realize that a lot of these are also about IT modernization. Cutting costs, security and compliance, automation, accelerating service delivery, um, self-service, integration, hybrid management, all of these are still also about the same thing. So you could argue that almost every single one of these initiatives cited at the core is IT or infrastructure modernization. So I, you know, I already said I'm just going to keep beating the drum. It's a long road. There are many paths to get to your destination. Um, many stopping points along the way. Um, but you've got to really think through that. But there's no, again, there's no, there's no singular way to traverse this journey. I will say, though, you've got to start by thinking about the foundation you're building on. Um, some things to think about there, you know, how do you get to modern, flexible platforms? Um, and this is where we talk a lot about x86 and Red Hat Enterprise Linux. Have you started that first step of getting off of risk Unix systems and giving yourself a more flexible platform based on Linux and RHEL that gives you this flexibility to do more agile things um, and start moving into these directions like public cloud, private cloud, et cetera, containers. Um, virtualization, you know, resource pooling. Again, that's assuming you're you know, doing this on top of Linux, but have you started that journey as well? Standard operating environments. You know, creating those gold images around several uh, sort of IT patterns, you know, database, web server, um, 
maybe application infrastructure or other key business apps. But have you created a standard operating environment for a few of those key uh, application use cases? And then other areas too that get into you know, things like middleware and applications. But have you, really, have you created the foundation that's going to make the modernization sequences uh, somewhat easy? So those are, the, those are the things to ask before you start. So let's start discussing some specifics about how to, to tackle this and where Red Hat's portfolio can help. So the first step in, you know, in creating that foundation, as I mentioned, involves you know, Unix to Linux migration and looking at Red Hat Enterprise Linux as a modern, um, a modern leading Linux platform to base all of this work on. Not only does it give you the flexibility to move forward, but it also can can provide for you significant cost reductions um, and ROI by getting off of those more expensive risk Unix systems. Standard operating environment, you know, we talk about Red Hat Enterprise Linux and, and satellite, satellite being our, our content management and, and sort of system and server management system that provides uh, secure content for your connected systems in your environment, sort of on premise for you. But that's a way to define your standard operating environment inside of satellite and then propagate it out to avoid server drift, to avoid um, you know, kind of these snowflakes occurring outside of your organization, which come back to haunt you because they become very expensive to maintain uh, because they're, they're unique and they've drifted. And then virtualization, um, of course, a way to start bringing servers together, collapsing them, and getting better utilization uh, out of these servers. And that density drives some efficiency and some cost savings as well. Customer example of, of someone who's done this is Casio. They used to use virtualization from many different companies, including VMware. And they used to find a result of that. It was they would have to buy very expensive systems and hardware to support this, this, um, this complex virtual infrastructure they had set up. Um, so they looked to Red Hat to deliver Red Hat virtualization and Red Hat storage server to bring this environment together almost in a, you know, this is a couple of years ago, but I would contend that this is an early example of hyper-converged infrastructure. Bringing this together with software-defined storage and Red Hat virtualization managing this, this pool of resources together to deliver significant efficiencies to them from a single vendor, but also con you know, built off of a standard operating environment. So this was an example of, of how to create that foundation. Another example, British Airways. British Airways was, was struggling because their business was growing um, and they were, they were finding the need to create more applications and extend, extend the capability of, British, of BA.com, their website. Um, quite rapidly and the, the infrastructure it was built on, again on VMware, was not allowing them that agility to, to rapidly scale and it also was not providing the, the uh, reliability they needed. So they, they had these struggles um, and their developers were also struggling through very uh, slow provisioning cycles to get access to new VMs to do their development. So they moved their environment to Red Hat virtualization um, and it therefore supported, and they did it in a way with, with the help of Red Hat services to migrate BA.com onto this new infrastructure serving almost a half a million visitors per day. But they also added in self-service capability through the, Rev, the Red Hat virtualization uh, self-service portal. Um, and also, you know, this helped accelerate and, and streamline their service delivery and their development cycles. And also, they achieved, through the, the use of the standard operating environment, um, they achieved the uptime and reliability they needed. So this was, this was a, key, you know, a key example of someone who also started by creating that, that solid foundation on which to modernize. So now let's start looking at the, the four, we're going to look at four paths to modernize. And we're going to start by looking at um, you know, streamlined and automated. You know, how do we, uh, again, achieve those digital business attributes of being streamlined and automated by implementing some technologies that can help drive it. So one is around provisioning uh, and Red Hat Cloud Forms. You've heard a lot of stories about Cloud Forms uh, this morning. 
but cloud form helps drive policy driven uh, self-service and automation for the the provisioning and deployment of virtual machines and then the ongoing management of them and you know through this we have many many customers who have realized significant um, collapses in their development to deployment to production cycles because of the self-service capabilities of cloud forms and I'm going to give you an example of one in a minute but that automation the workflow uh, and the kind of approval of that whole provisioning cycle with built into cloud forms helped deliver that streamline and automated attribute configuration management I'm not going to dwell on this one because you just heard a great presentation from Tim about the about what Ansible provides you know as an automation tool uh, driving kind of the infrastructure and IT automation across you know multiple multiple use cases whether it's uh, physical servers virtual infrastructure containers um, you know you can do it's such a flexible platform you can do so much but ultimately it really drives um, a set of a level of automation that Tim gave some great proof points around um, for how significant time and cost savings can be to the IT organization so again Ansible um, delivering a way for the, the business to become more streamlined and automated as a digital business customer example here that I promised I would talk about is Cox Automotive um, Cox Automotive is a brand and a name that people don't necessarily know however the companies that they uh, con they represent and run you do know they run um, uh, autotrader.com they run um, Kelly Blue Book and own that and they have about I think uh, 30 different companies like those some obviously many smaller ones under the Cox Automotive brand but as a result they they realize across their properties you know 18 million unique visitors per month so a very very significant volume of web traffic but they are also you can imagine with 30 different businesses request to change apps functionality on these web properties is just through the roof and they were having a very hard time responding to all of these requests coming in from the business so what did they do they implemented cloud forms as that self-service automation um, pr and provisioning portal uh, setting policies for the developers to do you know who could check things into uh, test environments who could actually uh, promote things from uh, test into production so policies but all automated with workflows and kind of role-based access throughout and they saved 4,500 hours in engineering time which amounted to about 4.9 million in, in developer you know translating into developers uh, time that that was cost savings for them more importantly it took you know it went from days of provisioning these virtual machines to their developers down to minutes so significant agility and responsiveness driving driving that streamlined and automated uh, aspect of being a digital business so let's now look at elasticity and scalability again as an attribute for the digital business so how do you achieve that how do you achieve scaling up and scaling down cloud bursting well there are multiple ways to do that you can do that with a managed private cloud based on OpenStack with our management tools like cloud forms on top you can do that with software defined storage we talked about that a little bit this morning you can also do it with a hybrid cloud in conjunction with sort of on-premise capabilities and Red Hat's certified cloud providers like Azure, uh, Google Cloud Platform, or AWS. Cloud Forms being the overarching management platform that allows you to manage across those those uh, hybrid clouds. So this is a way for you, for the customer for you to achieve elasticity through the different tool tools we provide uh, on the road to being a digital business um, a couple of examples that I'll talk about here uh, Yale and US which is a collaborative college in Asia um, they were they were also struggling to respond to the requests of their research staff inside the university and so they they needed to do this uh, in a you know with fewer people um, but delivered sort of a scalable computing platform for their research teams and and what they did here was really around lab environments and classes they they set up these these labs that could be sort of provisioned but also when when the class and lab was finished torn down and those resources made available to other 
uh, professors and faculty and researchers. And this, this was, they were able to support this with just a minor increase in staffing, um, but completely reinvent the, the, the kind of resource and scalability they deliver to the college, the college team. Another example, very, very similar, um, although it's, instead of uh, being aimed at sort of the classroom and lab environments, this Nanyang Technological University in Singapore, they were aiming um, their, this compute capacity at this, the, the science teams doing high performance computing. And so needing, needing uh, an OpenStack based cloud to do high performance computing, you know, to, to do molecular simulation, uh, high energy particle physics, things like that. So this was a way, um, this was a way that Nanyang delivered this capability around, again, around scalability. They could never anticipate well the needs of their research team, but with an OpenStack based cloud, they could pr create a platform that scaled up and scaled down very effectively for them. The third path is around you know, at being agile and responsive as a digital business. And we believe that that can be delivered through the underlying capability um, that is provided through containers, through microservices, and through a DevOps platform. Uh, you, OpenShift container platform being the, the prime example of that. So you know, multiple ways to get to that endpoint, starting with kind of small containerized um, applications running on single hosts, um, but getting you know kind of that replatforming going by using containers, containerizing those existing applications that run your business, getting them onto um, a runtime and an environment, a host that can support containers. And you can do that with RHEL Atomic Host or OpenShift Container uh, Lab. You can also go into you know, a more extensive integrated container application platform that has the workflow and the automation and the, CD, the CI CD built into it, uh, you know, source to image and fully automated uh, capabilities for development all the way through to test and production, and then managing the scale of that environment uh, as, it, as it propagates through multiple geographies. And Red Hat OpenShift Container Platform is the vehicle to get to that, um, that nirvana, nirvana of a fully integrated container application platform. And then finally, Red Hat Cloud Suite, which is a combination of OpenShift and OpenStack and the management tools around it, gives you the capability to do that full-on uh, vision I painted for OpenShift, but now doing it on scalable cloud infrastructure with OpenStack. So that's the way to get to agile and responsive. You know, changing applications in a matter of minutes um, very quickly, as opposed to waiting for these you know, month or quarterly cycles that, that usually occur. Um, Amadeus. Uh, you may have heard of Amadeus. They're sort of the European uh, equivalent of Sabre, who's a more of a North America-centered you know, company. But Amadeus is the underlying infrastructure for the hospitality industry, whether that has to do with airline reservations or, um, or hotel inventory and other things. But they really deliver that underlying infrastructure to you know, transact business across the hospitality industry, uh, again, very centered on Europe. Well, they, they get incredibly high volumes of requests coming across their network, 210,000 queries per second at peak times. Um, and they are dealing with um, you know, multiple connected service providers who tie into their systems around the world that have to connect into this platform. So how do they respond? You know, how do they deal with, with this and the scale? Well, they used OpenShift. Um, and they did it uh, on OpenStack. So scale with the integrated platform that OpenShift provides. And they were a testimonial for us, I think over at Red Hat Summit in 2015 and continue to be a very important uh, customer who talks about the benefits of, of the way they, they've achieved this uh, agility, speed, yet scale uh, that, that I mentioned. Another example that Diogenes talked about this morning was FICO. And I won't belabor this because Diogenes explained it very nicely, but I will just summarize you know, FICO reinventing their business, um, 
into a, a SaaS model called the FICO Analytic Cloud that also allowed partners to tie into this capability and deliver uh, similar application functionality leveraging FICO. And they are also doing this with OpenShift on OpenStack. And then the last example of, of, path, of a path to infrastructure modernization is around how do we deliver those, again, utility-like services that the digital business thinks about uh, as core attributes. So, se several offerings that allow that. Um, I've talked a lot about cloud forms and the policy-driven capabilities, but those policy-driven capabilities are important because they provide, you know, security, role-based access, identity, and authentication. Um, and also, frankly, you know, ver even things like version control, you know, where you know, certain VMs may be uh, older versions that need to get deeper visioned, or maybe you're going to put expirations or rules against certain VMs being put into production. So there's a whole set of governance uh, based on policy that is set within cloud forms that helps deliver utility-like resources. You know, I talk about specific examples if you read the text here about VMs not starting unless certain patches are applied to them. So that deals with versioning. And then of course the whole notion of you know, who, who on the development team has the, the rights and responsibility to, pr to promote a VM into a production environment. Um, you know, single namespaces for, for, uh, for file systems and storage. That also you know, helps extend this capability of a single view of data that can be accessed from multiple places uh, on the planet, multiple devices. Red Hat cluster storage is a way to do that through a software-defined storage fabric. And then last but not least, um, Red Hat Enterprise Linux, not only being a highly available uh, you know, leading Linux platform, also has capabilities built into it for identity management, tying into directory systems and services um, that allow you to really leverage uh, the controls for you know the Linux domains you set up, the network domains you set up, so you're really controlling with set policy and security who's accessing what resources and applications. Uh, I have an example here that I'll talk about for Red Hat storage is Intuit. Um, Intuit, the famous uh, the maker of uh, the famous product called TurboTax. I don't know if that's a product that's uh, used here in Canada, but it's certainly a very popular product in the U.S. And they <coughs> needed. Um, you know, especially on a cycle of tax season, which in the U.S. is, you know, usually January to April is when the filings occur. They needed a scalable, uh, flexible platform to, you know, have a way to store all these tax returns that customers were creating and then accessing uh, based on a, a, a software-defined model that gave them a cost structure, but also a, a reliability that they needed. And so they had been built, they had built a system off of proprietary storage appliances before, but Gluster allowed them to move to a much more cost-effective yet scalable platform and drop their costs per terabyte of storage by a factor of 16. So this is a, you know, kind of a, a good customer proof point and example of that last, of that last step to modernization, that being, you know, delivering, delivering utility-like capabilities. So, you know, so, so what's the path forward? Um, the path forward can be summarized the following way. You know, ensure that you have a modern uh, foundation uh, to start with, which touches on many different things, including, you know, you know are, have you moved on to a Linux platform, ideally a Red Hat Enterprise Linux platform, standard operating environment, secure, um, maybe even started with resource pooling and virtualization. So have you started creating that modern foundation on which to begin the journey? Um, assess where you are in that journey. You may have already gone down several paths and you're quite a ways to, you know, toward modernization uh, and now you just want to start knocking off some additional areas. You may have not started at all. Um, that's okay, but just know where you are and, and, and really know sort of where, you know, where your kind of capabilities are lying. Know where your company's culture, processes, uh, and skills are to support the journey you're going to start on. Start small, and in, in many cases it means, you know, use Red Hat services, Red Hat Consulting, to help you uh, do a proof of concept, starting small, and do some pilots. Get your, you know, get your feet wet, get started, get comfortable. Uh, think big, but start small. 
And then last but not least, as I've mentioned many times, there's no single path uh, to begin or to take. So pick the right path for you. Pick multiple paths if that makes sense. Uh, but really, you have to sort of think about it holistically in terms of your strategy, your investment uh, profile, and, and all those capabilities that I, I mentioned as to whether, you know, where you are in terms of skills, culture, um, mindset, etc. So that's, that's all I've had, and I think we have probably five minutes for questions, and I'll uh, thank you and leave it to Claude to facilitate that. All right, so um, actually we have more than five minutes, so we're good, so we can get deep into this. Um, thanks, Mark. Does anybody have questions for Mark? Covered a lot of topics. Um, no questions? Mark's from Boston. You could ask about the Red Sox. Um, go ahead. So in some of these slides you show things like thousands of hours of engineering time saved, um, does that include all the time spent transitioning into some of the tools? Or how do you calculate those types of savings? That's a great question. I, I didn't um, do the study that was referenced and Cox Automotive was the specific guy. You can, and by the way, you can find the case study and a video on our website about Cox Automotive. Um, I don't know the answer specifically. I would expect that there was certainly an investment in time to get up to speed on these tools, but you know, clearly the time saved in that snapshot was probably the first year. So I'm sure whatever investment they had to make in training and skills was recouped multiple times over. That's a good point. Any other questions? I have a quick question. How many people here are involved in projects that have the word transformation or modernization in them right now at your organizations? Actually, it's, it's a good number. Um, how many of you are actually feeling that pressure? Whether you have a project called that way, how many of you are under pressure to look at the next gen architecture, the next gen um, infrastructure that you're going to have to implement? Yeah, it, it varies. A lot of companies, what we're seeing right now, a lot of companies, um, they're a little concerned, right, with, with the big move. But the companies that we see doing it, and Mark, maybe you can comment on this, they're not doing it as big moves. They're waiting for that use case that just makes it possible, right? That, that's the use case. Let's get our hands dirty and let's, let's start moving that direction. Yeah, I mean, I sort of said that at the end. A lot of, when I say you know, start small, do a proof of concept around it, that's exactly what's happening. We see a lot of companies starting to just, you know, let's try this. Let's see if it gets the benefits we thought and try it kind of on the side in the sandbox, play with it, get comfortable before we decide to go big. And that's absolutely uh, what, we, what we see with a lot of these projects. Yeah, and that's definitely the way a lot of the companies that we're working with right now, it's really the, the beginning stages. And we'll hold your hand as you go through that, through that process, right? As you build up your, your skills. All right, so, any other questions? I just want to, I mean, ask, yeah. did, did what, did you all see yourselves in sort of the, the journeys I was painting? And I, I mean, I got a lot of head nodding from folks and certainly there, there aren't a lot of questions. So I hope that means that it resonated and you're like, yep, I got it because we're on that path and doing these five things or whatever. So is that true for everyone? Are people seeing that is, is what we're doing here reflecting what you're doing in your, in your business, what you're seeing right now? Yeah. Okay. All right, then I guess, I guess you're just too good, Mark. <laughs> no, no think, another think, question. There you go. customers are too good, really. Thank you very much for this presentation. Um, you went through a lot of cases where you were successful. Can you give us some tips where the modernization process didn't work properly? What are some common mistakes we should be looking for going on? So I, I think, I mean, you know, there are several examples with OpenStack going back a couple of years ago where, and you probably could even read if you hunted online, some stories about OpenStack being very challenging to work with. Um, there was a level of sort of maturity with OpenStack that's now finally, um, you know, there. We, we announced and released our first version of OpenStack three years ago. Um, and we've gone through, I think, six iterations uh, of releases. But the earlier ones, 
and we and and there were probably a few before that before we started releasing our versions there were community releases coming that were very raw uh, very unproven and and only for you know the the real uh, diehards who had deep skills and staying power to get in there and and, and I and I'm not going to name company names, but a few companies got in too early, started to try to be too ambitious with the technology, and, and now have decided that they do not want anything to do with it. And they sort of, I think they tried a little bit too soon, if that makes any sense. So that was true with OpenStack, you know, about two or three years ago. Now we're seeing a mat maturity of OpenStack. We're seeing a, a more available skill set in in the industry and at specific customers. We're seeing tools and technologies like, you know, we have uh, Red Hat OpenStack Director, which is the installation framework for OpenStack that we invested in and released because it helped address some of these challenges. Um, we're also going to be simplifying the life cycle of OpenStack, um, which I'm not going to pre-announce here because that'll, that'll be announced um, I think it, at OpenStack Summit at the end of October is when we will announce that. But there are some changes to the OpenStack lifecycle that will make it easier. So we're, we're getting smarter. Um, but there were, there were times when companies were just too ambitious and jumping in too early uh, to the technology. It, it's interesting. There's just to that point, um, I can't name the customer. I won't even name their industry because we're Canada and we're just not that big. But um, the, it's, um, they had gone into OpenStack around 18, 20 months ago with, with a vendor, and a vendor who knows their stuff, right? But they got in early, and they had this vision, and they rolled out 800 instances, 800 instances of OpenStack running. Um, around 10 months into it, they stopped their project. They said, you know what? This isn't working. And it wasn't OpenStack as such. It was actually everything around it. It was just, you know, had we thought through everything, all that. Then they called us in. I said, listen, we like the direction you're going in. They said, we're not questioning OpenStack. It was interesting. What we're questioning is, do we have the right vision around it? Do we have the right processes? Have we thought through all the details? And then we went in for a couple of months. And this isn't so much selling Red Hat as answering your question. We went in, and they, they were much more knowledgeable the second time around. And they were very clear with, this is what we know we want and what we know we don't want. And all of a sudden, they're now up to like 1,200 instances running on our OpenStack. But they had to step back because they got in early. Yeah. They, uh, they got a little too ahead of themselves, and um, so yeah, it's, it's a matter of, but I think we're in a better place now. Like a couple of years ago, Director wasn't there, and a lot of other technologies weren't yeah. there, right? Yeah, exactly. So I'll give it, you made me think of another example, Claude. The, um, the earlier, some of the early stage OpenStack, and even, even today there are vendors there who are so anxious to do what you need that they end up taking you down a path of extreme customization to a point where the, the version that you have implemented looks nothing like the upstream community-based OpenStack. It looks nothing like any other implementation. We call those snowflakes. Um, but that's also a risk to be careful of, because some, some vendors in the industry, rather than say, no, this is the wrong path to go down, and you'll, sometimes you'll hear Red Hat say that to you. Um, they'll say, oh, sure, we can do that, and absolutely, and then they'll, they'll bring in consultants and they'll tailor the implementation to you, but you end up with this thing that when the next version of OpenStack is released and, they, and you say, hey, we want to upgrade the Nova, uh, the Nova project and Compute Node onto this implementation, they're like, oh, we, we can't do that because we just changed it so much that it, it's now, it can't be, it can't be adapted. So, those are things to be careful of. I worry about that in the container space, too, because it, there are so many um, companies anxious to get into containers that they're going to end up maybe losing the sight of the notion of, OK, what's a standard deployment that can be extensible and still tied to the community and, and set of standards coming out of the upstream, such that when things refresh, we can update and have longevity of our, of our solution. All right. Great. Um, any last questions before we get Brian up here? All right, well, we're going to pass out the hypothermia blankets, um, and everyone will be good. We'll warm you up. Um, so <laughs> it's amazing. I feel, I feel like we're really putting you on a roller coaster today, heat-wise. So um, all right, then, Brian, are you ready to go? And um, we'll give him a couple of minutes to get started. And then so now um, it's going to be uh, 
Well, the roadmap for containers and DevOps. So hopefully that's, uh, and then after that, just um, two words, happy hour, okay? And then, Thank uh, you, everyone. We'll go from there. Thanks, Mike.